and uh, 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 twice in physics and chemistry. And uh, I uh, got uh, in chemistry for uh, like artificial radioactivity because of iron curry, uh, we are now using radioisotopes for saving uh, human life in medicine and other areas, especially in, in brachytherapy as well. And for uh, uh, Mary Curie, we have got the whole branch of uh, say radioactivity and also medical physics, we can say. But both of them have died of leukemia as a consequence of the radiation exposure they received during their experiment with radioactivity. So we can say Marie Curie was the pioneer and Marie Curie was the one of the V of radiation. So if we look at the another uh, uh, example here, this is a hand of a dentist. So we know that the dental x-ray are one of the lowest x-ray, but it is chronic x-ray. So this person worked for 35 years held X-ray films in place in patient's mouth. But the X-rays were there for like a kind of for 35 years. And what happens is the thumb has been partially needed to be amputated. And also the damaged skin here that was permanently damaged because of the radiation. So that was needed to be uh, a skin grafted. And the lesion of the finger is a skin cancer subsequently that needed to be removed. But we can see that this type of radiation that is not directly coming to them, but it's a kind of passive radiation here as a radiation worker can cause problem, can cause cancer. So what do we need to do? We need to protect ourselves. If we look at our earlier dose limit, say earlier means if we, our industry is more than 100 years old now, so from 1900, if we think about 1900 to 1920, that early 20 years, we did not have any dose limit. If you see that at that time, even like 25,000 millivolts or 25 sieverts were also the dose. Then from 1920, when we have got this, the uh, National Radio Protective uh, Society is formed, we reduced that to 0 0.5, 0 0.5 is still 500 millisieverts. So then from 1940 to 1960, it was about 250 millisieverts. And from 1960 to 1980, it comes to 50 millisieverts. So then from uh, mid eighties, uh, most of the countries in the world, uh, including Australia, our dose limit 20 millisieverts per year for radiation worker. But America, they haven't changed it yet. So they have got the dose limit is still 50 millisieverts. So in my discussion today, I'll be stick to the Australian standard because I work here in Australia. And it will be very similar to our Asian countries. So the annual effective dose in Australia and uh, many other countries are very similar. So for the whole body for radiation worker, it's 20 millisieverts per year and over five year period. So this over five year period, it's normally we consider like saying any particular year, if you go 50 millisieverts. So next four year, we need to have like reduce it to 10 uh, uh, millisieverts per year and so on. But 20 millisieverts with all other uh, the uh, radioprotective measure we take nowadays, 20 millisieverts is we, we, okay, we don't, I'll show you some uh, 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 data that we have. This column is a new uh, inclusion in Austrian standard. We have got radiation worker, uh, their age is less than 18, but uh, more than 16. So for them, know that their radio sensitivity is higher than the grown-ups. So their radiation uh, dose limit is six millisieverts per year and general public is one millisieverts per year. And we have got the equivalent dose. If you remember a few years back, even like uh, five years back, this lens of the eye uh, was 150 millisieverts per year. But because of the uh, uh, cases we have that the radiographers and the radiologists, especially uh, having the uh, cataract, forming the cataract on the eye because of the excessive radiation to the eye, uh, lens of the eye, this reduced to 
20 millisievert per year. So this is the dose limit, and we need to actually follow this by regulation, by radiation act, we have got to have every one of the radiation worker has to have their a personal dosimeter and we need to monitor it. And what's the best process of doing it? Best process is basically the shielding the dose. So look at the workforce in medical practitioners in Australia. So in Australia for radiation worker, they need to do at least a bachelor degree of four years nowadays. So, and then they get the registration or at least two years of master's degree to get the practitioner license. So if we look at that here, about almost 15,000, uh, these are early 2021 data. So about 15,000 diagnostic radiographers uh, we have, and we have got about 1,250 uh, uh, nuclear medicine technologists and about more than two and, two and a half thousand the uh, radiation therapist. So almost about 19,000 uh, uh, registered radiation worker we have. Now we need to protect them in the clinic because they are all exposed to the radiation. So radiation therapists, they normally use like very high beam. So it's a for therapeutic reason. And they are more directly going to the patient. So we can say that their dose is still there. They get some passive dose from there, but their beam are so highly uh, energetic at some just a kind of ready. Actually, it's not enough for them. Before we go further, I need to show you some more uh, the radiation uh, practitioners age group. So as you see, our the average age group maximum, they are about like the 40. So if we take that majority of like half of the population is uh, below 40, and then still there are more. So, and we have got about like the substantial, like about uh, 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 one and a half thousand worker uh, the, uh, less than 25 years old. So that is the age group. Another group, the gender is very important. Why important? I'll be explaining it uh, uh, late uh, in, the, in, the, uh, in, a, in, in a short time. So in Australian workforce, the medical radiation practice workforce, you can see that almost 70% are women. They are female, almost 70%, about 32% are male. So, so more than two thirds, of the workforce are female. So why this female and age group is important here? Because if I show you this one, these are the risk factor you already know. And if you look at here, that is the age of the exposure with radiation. And this is the lifetime attribute risk of cancer, about 100,000 population. So if you look at here, the females are more the cancer Pro, we can say the cancer incident from radiation exposures, we know that fall dramatically with the age. So younger people are more vulnerable to, or they have got higher risk for radiation uh, uh, induced cancer. So our workforce are more than 50% are uh, somewhere here. So they have got still quite a significant uh, risk of having cancer because of their uh, exposure to the radiation. And also it is very clear here, the population average about like 8.6% per severed, the uh, uh, cancer incident risk is male, but for female, it's very high, much higher than the uh, a male, it's 12.8% per severed. So it is clear that the females are more radiosensitive than the males. So we need to look at our most two thirds of our work population, uh, the workforce are female and they are vulnerable because their risks are higher. But when you use the protective gown, our gown are a kind of like general setup for everyone. So it's a more male, female design is not generally available. So it's a kind of common design we all use. So in one of our uh, uh, projects, I, I'll show you some result out of it. So that actually uh, address that issues. So in the clinic, as before I uh, go to different uh, uh, type of scenario, 
So these are the Australian average dose. So in bracket, these are the maximum dose in any particular case, the maximum dose in particular year. And average dose in the small hospital for radiographer is very low annual, only 33 microsievert, where 20,000 microsievert is allowed. So large hospital is a little bit higher and the private hospital is a little bit higher. And even the highest dose is not more than like two millisieverts per year. So this is not a problem at all because it's within the limit. But the problem is we know if a person is working continuously, the risk of having cancer because of the chronic dose is there. We cannot just say, we, well, you don't need to worry. No, there are things to be worried. So radiologists, they do the cardiology, they do the interventional, they do the fluoroscopy, so their dose is higher. So we know that most of our radiographic dose coming from interventional or fluoroscopy. So that is also not very high. It's a 321 microsievert. That is just like one third of a one millisievert. So for even private hospital, that is even lower. Even for the highest dose, that is not more than three millisieverts. But if you look at the nuclear medicine technologist or nuclear medicine specialist, sometimes their higher dose is about 70 millisieverts, almost close to the uh, uh, dose limit. So radiation therapists, their dose are still high, but these are all the passive dose they get. And because their radiation protection, the, the radiation uh, use, they, they use their beam are mega voltage range, a mere shielding is not sufficient. We can't do anything with that shielding. So we don't actually try to do any uh, anything about like besides the distance and besides the uh, bunker and etc. Uh, the just uh, wearing a gown is not enough for radiotherapist. But what about nuclear medicine people? So in Australia, normally we say that a different radioisotope have different energies. So we don't have a protocol for using the gown for nuclear medicine. We don't use the radiation, uh, their shielding uh, uh, gown, the lead gown for the nuclear medicine. But we have taken a project just to see exactly whether our, uh, uh, what source of protection the lead gown gives to our nuclear medicine people. So wearing lead aprons is not common practice in Australia. At Panza, that is our, the Radiation Protection and Nuclear Safety Agency, they recommend 0.5 millimeter lead equivalent aprons for closed contact only if the patient use 800 megabat bottle of technetium 99M. Technetium 99M is within the range of 140 kilo electron volt. So that can give some protection, but for higher doses, I'd say higher energies is not good. So we know that because the with high energies, high atomic number produce the bremer stalling radiation and the also the high jet material are not much suitable for high energy ionizing radiation protection. We even knowing it, we tested our the nuclear isotopes for different types of nuclear isotope, especially for the uh, uh, diagnostic one for the just we use for uh, the uh, uh, gamma camera and also for PET uh, uh, isotopes. So in collaboration with my uh, honors student, Robert Jemison, he's working now in the clinic and my clinical uh, collaborator, uh, Lisa and Paul from the Austin Health Hospital, uh, we investigate whether uh, the shielding garments provide adequate protection, whether the correct shielding is worn when various type of uh, 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 and the doses are used. And we explore the dose reduction provided by different types and thickness of the shielding. So what we did, we tested four different types of isotopes, technetium, iodine-131, and fluorine-18, and iodine-124. So these are for the PET imaging. So it's electron basically coming, that's the beta particle. So 511 keV beam energy for iodine is 362, for technetium is 140 keV. So we have 
used different types of shielding and we have used a phantom and in different position of the phantom we use our tlds and those tlds are especially made with very highly sensitive so even for a very small amount of radiation it can peak and afterwards well, we give the radiation exposure from radioisotopes at different distance and using different protective shielding. And we later on uh, measure these uh, uh, dose from the TLDs and we just placed it and then see what happened. So these are the result from the technetium uh, 99M. So as you see here, these are at the distance of two meter from the source. These are 1.5 meter from the source and these are one meter from the source. So as you see the dose rate at one meter, that is the closer, so it's higher. And then when it's going two meter, that is inverse square law that's applied that the physics law valid. And also we are increasing the thickness of our ladder prone from 0.25 to 1.25. And it actually shows that the, all the physics laws are valid here and 51% decrease in dose rate from 1 to 1.5 meter using 0.25 millimeter shielding. And when it's a 73% decrease of the dose if we use from one to uh, uh, two meter distance. So as we have found here, the, for the technetium, the dose uh, is actually reduced. It is a very effective uh, method to go a little bit behind from the patient and also from the source and also using uh, some uh, the ladder prone. So that's a kind of good thing we have got. But for iodine-131, we haven't seen actually much changes here. So as you see this, if we are increasing the thickness of our ladder prone, still we are not seeing much differences there. So that is say, saying that ladder prone is inadequate to be worn while we are handling iodine-131. So that is like too high energy. So even if we look at for the uh, fluorine-18, it still it just shows a little bit changes when we are using the lead shielding of 0.5 millimeter equivalent or 0.75 millimeter equivalent. So that is about reduction of about 40% with the dose rate decreasing. So that is quite just this kind of say it's okay if we use it, but when you use the iodine-124, that actually not showing an, a, a, anything, any changes. So even we have got a different change here, the heavier shielding, when you are increasing the thickness of our, uh, uh, the lead shielding, it is actually giving some high bremastalin because we know that when thickness increased, and basically there are more area uh, and energy is increased at high energy bremastalin produced. So that bremastalin actually added to the radiation absorption. So it's a kind of like kind of backfire when if it is high energy, we are using uh, a very thick um, uh, uh, like the uh, protection shielding uh, that is not it doesn't work. So we have published this one, the, uh, the findings in uh, the uh, radiation protection dosimetry uh, in uh, uh, 2015. And uh, further uh, investigation we have uh, done. And that's basically a kind of quite interesting uh, thing in the nuclear medicine. Now, most of our dose basically comes and our as a radiation protection uh, uh, personnel, we need to take care of our radiographers and radiologists. So we normally recommend that the personal protection should be worn. That is like currently we are using lead aprons and gloves about 0.25 to one millimeter equivalent. So that when you're saying the lead equivalent, that basically we are not directly using the lead in this apron. There are actually lead uh, oxide, those lead oxide is fused with the uh, plastic material and then just to get the lead sheet and from the lead sheet, out of that lead sheet, we produce uh, this lead gown. So these are most common in diagnostic radiography. And on top of it, we use like the thyroid shielding and we also use the eyeglasses and these, the lead equivalent glasses of 0.35 millimeter of lead equivalent glasses. So 
and also for our fluoroscopic area we need to protect like all because a lot of like the uh, 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 the scattering actually happens at that time. So I'll show you just a uh, kind of uh, image uh, from where we get huge amount of radiation, say from fluoroscopy. So in, and also the mobile radiography, we get a huge amount. So for, uh, from fluoroscopy, uh, both radiologists and radiologic technologists are exposed relatively high levels of radiation because that's the main uh, radiation comes. So we should wear a protective apron for each of these mobile examination and also uh, the uh, fluoroscopy. So if we look at this uh, image here, so here is our under table uh, fluoroscopic systems. Our X-ray tube is under table. So in the fluoroscopy, Basically, the tube is on for the whole procedure. Sometimes average time is like three, four minutes to sometimes if it is interventional, it takes about an hour or so if it is a critical case. So in both cases, if there was no apron used, so the dose could go up to here, 20 millisieverts per hour. But if we use that lead apron, all these scattered are actually absorbed by the apron and our dose actually goes somewhere here. So that's like even less than uh, two millisieverts per hour. So that is fine, that's acceptable. If we do other way around, when we have got extra tube is above the table and our image intensifier under the table. So then it's still like say lead is protecting, but there are some radiation actually can come to the, uh, uh, the uh, radiologist phase and also the uh, uh, attending uh, technologist phase and etc. But it's, it's still, when you have got the without ladder prone, it could go like here, but with the ladder prone, it's still there are above percentage of uh, doses, a scatter and leakage doses are actually just taken care of. So this is a this is a good scenario because ladder prone is doing good so far for uh, almost 100 years now it's actually doing good but there are problems with the lead itself because we know that lead is toxic lead is heavy and lead gowns are also have some internal problems so we use like the shielding effect if there is no shielding if we just look at the dose distribution, that is the scatter dose coming from the fluoroscopic uh, procedure, it can go up to here. Look at that. These are the milligray per hour. As we go closer, the dose rate actually increase. But if you use a shielding, a proper shielding here, even like cover the uh, extra tube, it actually saves huge amount of dose. So that is like not only we using our protection for our body and also where we can, we need to use our the side and the other area that the secondary areas of the radiation sources uh, needed to be shielded. So we in our uh, general standard protocol, we follow it. So there is no argument about it, we follow it. So the thing is, the radio protective aprons about like say for fluoroscopy, we say about 0.5 millimeter uh, of lead equivalent are recommended. But when we say like 0.5 millimeter recommendation, normally like say 0.17 millimeter of lead equivalent is mass is about 2.3 kilogram per meter squared. So when it goes to 0.5 millimeter recommendation, it's about three times of these. So this mass of one square meter lead of 0.5 millimeter can go up to about seven kilogram. So if we make one of this protective gown, it needs at least like one square meter. So that actually weigh about eight kilogram. So if a person is wearing that eight kilogram for eight hours a day, so that is really a big problem. So those who are working uh, with these heavy lead gown, we know that how uncomfortable and how heavy is this. So there are lots of research going on for lightweight lead replacement. So those are composite of materials such as barium, tungsten, and also bismuth. They are 
just saying that reducing the total weight about 20 to 30 percent but still we haven't got a standard uh, 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 substitute of lead so what do we did here well it, we, we did some uh, tested of uh, and looking for some alternative material just to replace the lead. So the issues associated with the current lead approach, it's manifold. So first thing, it is the vulnerable to cracks because the, we know that lead is very heavy, but at the same time, very soft. So when you use the lead oxide, that is heavier but it's like when you put a gown made out of lead uh, uh, oxide and then lead sheet, it is very easily cracked. It produces micro holes, it rips and tears because we use that for like, and it, we have got the protocol to check uh, time to time uh, the uh, quality of these uh, uh, the, uh, aprons, but we are very busy. So we are wearing one gown for a long time and then basically they are shifting and then it's not a kind of personalized lead gown. So you have got our personalized, uh, the uniform, but lead gown, not many hospital has got the personalized lead gown. So there are like the holes, rips and tears. So that is the problem. If there are micro holes, it is not protecting, but it is giving a kind of false uh, sense to me, a kind of like the false security to me that, okay, I'm protected but maybe I'm not. It's too heavy and lead is toxic by nature. So we know that the lead toxicity, there is no limitation or there is no threshold for non-toxicity of the lead. Lead is toxic all the way. So we know that and then lead toxicity can get problem with us. And we have got lots of several cases basically because of the low, uh, lead toxicity. So if we can get something that is all other problems are there, but it's not toxic, it's still that material is better. If we can show that, that is actually just protecting us from the, or shielding us from the radiation. So it can absorb and retain the odors and dart, micro dart inside, so the lead. So those lead cleaning is also recommended, but it is not easy uh, actually to do all this thing because the maintenance will cost a huge uh, for many departments. And also the most important thing is by a lot of people uh, and a lot of uh, organization don't look at that. That is called the poor fitting. The lead gowns we use in the clinic they are like, there is no difference between like, that's just only the size difference, maybe just the kind of like the uh, 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 length and different fitting size, but it is not fitted because it's male and female or different body shapes. It doesn't fit properly there. So it's a very poor fitting. So that poor fitting, especially for our, the omen uh, radiographers and for the omen uh, medical radiation practitioner, it can cause problem because when the scattering radiation comes, so if the fitting is not there, proper fitting is not there, the, they absorb more. And we have got evidence that the, because of the poor fitting of lead apron, there are slightly increased uh, number of breast cancer among the radiation worker, female radiation worker. So these are the lead apron issues. So what we did, we have actually just scanned uh, with lead gown with the X-rays, like different types of cracks. These are micro cracks. And also we have seen like there are tears, there are the, uh, 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 the, the, the holes, ribs, tears, and et cetera. Those, these are very common. So now, even when we look at that, so here, the, the defects like cracks and holes can leak radiation and cause overexposure. Another problem with these gowns, these are, there are different layers. And these layers, it's very thermally discomfortable, especially like we are talking about the temperature, like average temperature in Thailand or uh, some other areas, 
where the temperature is above 30 degrees Celsius for the whole day. And if someone has to wear one lead gown for like the six hours a day, it is very thermally discomfort. I, although they are working say for in the air condition, uh, 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 like the scenario, say the uh, uh, hospitals and et cetera, it's still the body temperature inside is actually trapped. So heavy weight cause the back pain. The high rates of skeletal related complaints among cardiologists who use lead approach. So this is a very important issue. We are trying to get actually some equivalent lead equivalent protection by other light element, but we still haven't found it because we, if we want to get the layer, the layer becomes thicker and then the weight becomes very similar to the lead. So we haven't solved this problem yet. This is still a valid problem. We can solve very easily the design issues because poor fitting associated with increased breast cancer among female radiographers. So we can at least design uh, some of the uh, lead aprons for especially designed for uh, the um, uh, female uh, radiographers. And especially there are changes during the pregnancy because we know that during pregnancy, the dose, as long as the dose is one millisieverts per year, uh, uh, they can work. They don't need to go for the whole uh, uh, maternity period for the uh, whole, uh, whole, uh, whole uh, period for leave. So they can work. So during that time, we have to have a specially designed uh, uh, lead gown or not lead gown, a specially designed uh, radioprotective gown for them. So what we did, we have actually done a number of projects in collaboration with our RMIT School of uh, Fashion and Textiles. So uh, Huda Ahmed uh, Magrabi was our PhD student and she was a fashion and textile uh, 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 like the uh, designer. And uh, she did uh, lots of designing and then produced lots of different uh, type of uh, alternative uh, uh, fabrics and Dr. Arun Bijayan and Dr. Li Zing Wang. So they also in the fashion and textile. And I looked at uh, the uh, physics part of it. So we had some successful uh, 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 project uh, completed uh, with this uh, collaboration. So first one, in all cases, we did actually some nylon and wool, wool uh, knitted fabric by using the bismuth oxide and antimony and also we use the bismuth oxide and barium sulfate. So we have uh, uh, published two, uh, two important paper. One is uh, with the bismuth oxide and another one is from the barium sulfate. I'll show you some results uh, in a minute with you. In all cases, we use uh, different types of bar coater, mold and casting method and a spray coating, a spray gun method to produce that. And in all cases, we use about like the 80 kbp that's the uh, peak X-ray. And we use about the uh, SID 80 centimeter and the field of view for exposure about 15 by 15 centimeter. And we use a rare safe detector and also a red check uh, plus dosimeter. So just to check each other, we have got two dosimeter. Those are electronic dosimeter. So we don't need to wait for, we can straight away get the result. So there are, we checked for the uh, apron and prototype design for compared. We looked at the thermal insulator. We looked at the water buffer just to see the sweating. And also we looked at 3D body scanning technology for checking the fitting and sizing. For fabric, we have looked at the yarn count, the fabric thickness, uh, mass per unit area. And for the durability of the coated fabric, we checked the breaking and tensile strength because that's very important for the lead. It is not that uh, good because if you do like, like this, it will have a brick, but we tried other material that is uh, actually the good uh, steep and that resistant uh, to the cracking. And also we look for the optical porosity by using the electron microscope. 
So in, we produced the single jersey knitted fabric by using this, the knitting machine. And we also did the uh, plating knitted nylon fabric with wool. And also we did the design and knit 3D seamless aprons by looking at their different internal structure or checking the porosity and et cetera. So the first result we published in uh, the Bismuth Oxide that is in the Textile Research Journal in 2015 where we have looked at different types of, uh, two different types of a distinctive uh, type of one is polyester and other is nylon uh, coated with the bismuth oxide. So as you look at here, these are all details. So this basically say we are using about say 100 gram PVC and 30 gram of bismuth oxide in that. And we are increasing the bismuth oxide to get the different types of uh, the uh, samples. And the main thing is we have done optical microscope, uh, the uh, uh, images, and from there, we can see that, that when we have got about 67% of bismuth oxide, that is giving us actually much better and uh, like the kind of less porosity. So when you look at the extra transmission, here, this is our, the regular lead, and this is our lead light. That means basically this is about 0.7 millimeter equivalent of the lead. And this is lead regular is 0.18 millimeter of lead. So when we have got like one, the bismuth oxide uh, and that like added to the samples and uh, with the polyester. And we have found that this effectiveness even better than the regular lead. So that is a kind of good thing. We have seen that, okay. Because this is much better of the durability and also porosity and et cetera. And this is not like a break, not, uh, breaking like the lead. But only thing is when you try to get the similar amount of absorption, the weight per square meter goes up. So that means it is still the lead is thinner than this one. But still, it's, we can't say that here is the winner, but there are some good points. So as we see here, about like say here, X-ray transmission is only 8% in this case. That means 92% attenuation happening. Uh, so whereas that is, this is higher uh, than the uh, uh, regular lead. On the other hand, if we look at the, just only the PVC, you see that the PVC, it's not only like say 15%, like the uh, uh, absorption, 85% is still, uh, even no matter how much uh, like the weight we are using, like if it is a three kilogram per square meter, just a PVC, it will produce like nothing. So basically we have got the bismuth oxide and from there we have got some idea that bismuth oxide is working, but it still is like kind of thickness is larger, but it's more durable than the lead. So it can be one uh, alternative of the lead. So we have looked at this scanning electron microscope image. And then these are the regular lead, these are the lightweight lead, and then their cross section. And also we have got the images for the uncoated nylon. Uh, this is basically about 1500 times uh, uh, magnified. And then we have got, this is the polyester uh, under the electron microscope. And then we have just say the microparticle size of bismuth oxide can also be effective for X-ray attenuation. It is actually showing very similar or sometimes better effect than lead. So what we have done next is uh, with the bismuth oxide, we have used some barium sulfate. So barium sulfate is also showing a good potential of attenuation. And when we add all together, so we have seen that those are actually having a uh, very good uh, interaction. And also their attenuation coefficient is almost close to the regular lead, but only problem is their, the thickness is higher. So where regular lead is about 0.8 millimeter, this one is almost double about 1.5 millimeter thick. So the problem is it is okay, it's, a, it's not breaking inside. It's not uh, uh, putting uh, some kind of holes inside, but it is actually breaking thicker. 
So if we use a designer approach, it will be like a kind of winter jacket for us. So that is a problem. So then we looked at uh, their mass, uh, total mass attenuation coefficient, because we know that total mass attenuation coefficient, mass attenuation coefficient multiply by the density will give us the linear attenuation coefficient. Linear attenuation coefficient led is still higher linear attenuation coefficient, because that is the internal property of the lead. But for other uh, particles that we are thinking, uh, they are uh, the, uh, it's very similar to the lead, but not as high as lead. So the findings we have uh, published that one in the uh, fiber journal and a high concentration of barium sulfate and bismuth oxide in the coating formulation should be considered. And also we have seen that it's a, it's a very uh, 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 like mixture comprising of the bismuth oxide and the barium sulfate and PBC shows the highest X-ray attenuation and that is very promising. So more work needed to be done here. So similar work are actually done with the, um, uh, the uh, nanoparticles. But the thing is, nanoparticles are more expensive. These are microparticles. So microparticles is a bit larger than nanoparticles. But if we can still get the similar result, so we can say this is like more uh, uh, suitable. So one more thing uh, I uh, before I finish, uh, we are almost, because of the time, I'll not show all details about this one. But this one, basically, we have done a 3D body scanning for the development of seamless knitted radiation shield garments, where we have looked at the different shape, body shape or male and female. And also we have designed an apron for say pregnant women. So we have explored with different types of scenarios. And also we have found that by designing the special type of design uh, uh, garments, even with the lead garments, we can get much better radiation protection. So this area needed to be explored a little bit more. So uh, uh, I'm almost uh, uh, finished. So before I finish, I must uh, acknowledge uh, my uh, contribution of my collaborators uh, for this work. Robert Jamison, Lisa Mong, Paul Yu, Huda Makrabi, Orun Bijayan, and Lising Wang. And also I'm uh, indebted and thankful to FM committee and special thanks to Professor Arun uh, Shugule and Professor uh, Hasin Anupama for inviting me uh, to give this talk. And uh, thank you everyone uh, for listening. Thank you very much. So I think I can uh, stop sharing now. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Pradeep for you are such a great uh, presentation and very informative and fascinating lecture regarding the, uh, the radio protective uh, design for radiation workers. So right now uh, I, I got a lot of the information, a lot of the question for, for your lecture. Um, uh, so let's take a look from the chat box. Uh, well, so, all right. So we start from the first question. Um, yes, so could you please tell whether the phantom place with the TLD uh, were exposed to direct beam or scatter beam as the apron are used for protection from scatter radiation? Okay, so this one, uh, the phantoms uh, placed with the TLD so are exposed to, it's a scattered beam. So basically we have got the phantom because our aim is not to actually expose with the primary. So we have got phantom here. In front of, we have got this lead gown and then the source. So basically source is coming. Uh, the beam is coming through the lead gown. So, and then this actually like, it's not a direct because we know that our uh, uh, the uh, operator will not be directly exposed to the primary beam. So we have got a, a passion position. We just geometrically put the passion position and then we clinically simulated where the, uh, the position of the phantom that is actually representing the radiation worker. So it was not directly exposed to the beam. So it's basically 
uh, TLD wire. Normally we just wear the TLD and then on top of it, the uh, uh, apron and we simulate it that way. So it was the uh, 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 as exact as uh, we could do. All right, so thank you uh, for your clear answer. Well, uh, for this, uh, come up with the same guys. Okay, secondly, could you please uh, explain the exact position of placement of the eye lens dosimeter uh, according to your presentation, having three chip each for left, right, and medium for lens dose yes. estimation. If the ER yeah, so uh, yeah, with this one, we course. have done actually for another project. We I haven't shown you here uh, the result of that. We had another project actually with the cardiologist. So that was the diet. Uh, uh, the um, uh, a dose uh, recording from during uh, the uh, one uh, the uh, operation like the interventional uh, so cardiologist where the like the uh, kind of like the eye dose monitor uh, through their glasses so we put like in two here and then we put one at the middle so basically middle gone with the headband so we have got regulation now where the cap so in the cap, we have put a headband. So at the center, we have put a OSL here and then two mini OSL here. So we are actually getting the direct dose from, and yes, on top of it, they are the lead uh, uh, goggles, yes. Okay, so uh, for, for my creation, uh, come up, follow with, the, with, with that uh, creation as uh, at our center, we have the experience to make sure the island dose in nuclear medicine uh, technologies uh, like who who is the, like the priority to to measure the island dose in 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 like in nuclear medicine uh, department? I think I think this is the the eye dose is uh, more important for cardiologists, especially mm -hmm. and the uh, uh, interventionals because they are continuously operating uh, while looking at the uh, screen because they are beam is already on, especially if the beam is under the table, it's a continuously on. And another thing we have, so I think it's a kind of habitual, what okay. happens is experienced uh, ready, uh, the cardiologist, what they do, they have got a tendency of, because they are, they, are, they are using the eye protection. So they have got a tendency of actually just by looking at this one too clearly, they do like this, they open okay. and then do like this. So when they open, they are actually exposed to the direct radiation. So that is a thing. So it is a it is an area where the eyes are more uh, used. Those are for the people, uh, especially the cardiologists and interventional radiologists. Okay. Yes, I see. I agree with you. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. All right. The next question is uh, kindly elaborate in detail in detail how poor feeling can increase breast cancer in female radiographer. Okay, so the evidence what we have got is basically say for an example, our, the most sensitive organ is say lungs and breast also have got lots of tissues. Those are basically absorbing. So they are soft tissues, so they absorb. So what happened poor fitting is when we have got a lead apron, so the lead, lead apron is basically sometimes if not only fit side, so it's basically they are, there are room for the skitter to get in. So that actually has got, depending on which side the person is actually attending, it can increase the absorption in breast. So that is the one. So we have got some phantom data uh, on that different position, uh, but for the uh, 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 prospect data is still not available. So, but, and, and also it is a kind of long time study needed. Uh, we can say extrapolate it, but for the prospective, it's very long time uh, 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 the uh, 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 research required. And so that's basically added a, just a, not saying that it is the significant and it is the cause, but it is actually adding a portion there. Yeah. All right. All right. Thank you. Uh, the next question uh, is very interesting question. Why do you choose uh, bismuth oxide to design the apron? 
Okay, so the bismuth oxide basically from the literature, so we are actually trying to figure it out. From the literature, we have found that bismuth oxide with the nanoparticles did actually very good uh, uh, work in the published, the earlier published work. So they did very work there with the nanoparticle. So that nanoparticle about the 100 to 200 and nanometer. So we thought those are expensive, but we thought that, okay, can we do this one, the bismuth, uh, oxide just to see whether it is working with the microparticles or n microparticle plus the different pvc or nylon or polyester so that can whether we can get that so with that it is actually showing very promising result so we mm -hmm. could have actually started with doing some other thing as well but i think this one was just taking say because some people did already trial and error method before so they have shown some path so we are actually took that one just to see whether it's actually working okay all right okay thank you uh next oh it's not it's not a question just say that wonderful lecture <laughs> to you oh, thank you very much <laughs> all right and uh well another question uh is there any criteria to accept or reject a late apron for holes or lie, for example, when we scan a late apron and find a hole, what side hole can be acceptable? Okay, so this one basically just see if I can see an X-ray image of the hole. So what does that mean? That means the X-ray can pass through the hole. So if X-ray can pass through the hole, this X-ray can go into the body. So if there is a hole, that means the X-ray is passing. X-ray wavelength is actually smaller than this hole. So if we can see this hole, that means like we can we can calculate suppose one hole, just one hole. So in that case, probability of getting X-ray to that particular hole needed to be a primary beam. So because we are exposing with the primary beam, but the secondary beam going to that, the possibility will be very very low. So in that case maybe number of holes and depending on where the hole is. Suppose the hole is somewhere in the uh, back. So if I'm standing in the front, the back doesn't matter. So we have to have a criteria, like if I'm worrying, where is the hole, the position? If the hole is like in front, that directly coming to the uh, uh, scattered, so there is a possibility that it can come into my body. Mm -hmm. So, yes. but there is no established criteria yet. So, because mm -hmm. we are always saying, you do your own criteria for your own clinic. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. yeah, so that's the kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that, that's a very uh, important recommendation, yes. Well, uh, Another from the guys, uh, from the participant. Uh, thanks, Professor, for your excellent oh, answer. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. All right. Oh, okay. And, and I got a message from uh, Chai Hong. Chai Hong already with us here. Uh, please kindly fill in the following form if you need a certificate for the CPD point that to credit by a CPSEM. So for participant, who those uh, for those who would like to obtain the, the credit, you can fill the form uh, according to the the, the Chai Hong that post on the chat box. Thank you so much, Chai Hong. Uh, well, do we have any question? Do we still have time, uh, Rani, uh, Rashni? Yes, I think we have. Uh, yeah, we can uh, extend it for uh, I think it's still a couple of minutes, maybe five uh -huh. minutes. Uh -huh. Uh, okay. <laughs> All right. So, yeah, uh, a comment to address the heavy lead apron issue is using coat skirt tie lead aprons. Uh, this is this is from uh, from from our participant. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So that's, I agree with that because like say when we have got a coat tribe, like say for an example, when you're saying 0.7 millimeter equivalent of lead, what do we do? We have got two layers in the front. So one come like this way. So you have got in the back, that is just only one layer, 0.35. At the front, 
it's becoming double layers. So it's like kind of 0.7. So you have got a problem like this. So, and we have got sometimes like two parts. One is for the uh, scar type at the, like the uh, uh, bottom part and then another at the top part. So, and also like uh, when for the cardiologist they need to use like the kind of uh, neck one as well, the collar one. So it's a kind of like, and continuous, just for a few minutes, it's all right. But when it is a busy center, like say uh, uh, on, on, on the, um, uh, uh, before we start, like we are talking about. Uh, so say the department like where uh, Professor uh, Bharma works. So 200 patients per day, it's a huge amount. So you don't have time actually to change mm -hmm. your comfort. And so that is, that is an issue, but we don't know how we do that. But there are some other types of things that we can see. Like say there are in MIT, they are designing uh, gowns, very light gowns for the space travelers. So, because they are very high energetic. So if we can reduce those mass for like our energy, diagnostic energy, we can get a kind of solution there. But remember, only thing is those are very, very, very expensive. So, mm -hmm. so, so that cost, I don't know who will be like uh, kind of happy to say, okay, uh, uh, this much money for your gown. I don't know. So that is the, uh, another problem we need to look at it. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. So thank you so much for your nice answer. Yes. Uh, that, that's all of the question that we for for your lecture, uh, wonderful lecture today. Um, thank you. yeah, thank you so much. And also thank you so much all participants for attending uh, this lecture. And well, um, I will, if we don't have more, any question, uh, I will pass this session back to uh, Rashmi to like for the closing the session. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Kittywat. So I must thank uh, Dr. Pradeep for such a wonderful and detailed lecture. I'm already feeling quite informed about the lead aprons, which I'm sure I'm not uh, very aware about. And I hope this would, be, this would be a kind of academic feast to our participants as well. And I also want to thank Dr. Kittywat for such an interactive and lively moderation. So I think we have uh, completed a wonderful session now. At last, I want to thank uh, all of our participants who has uh, who has been with us for every webinar, and their efforts also make us uh, encouraged to um, organize such events. So, uh, with this, I also before winding up, I also want to inform you uh, about our next monthly webinar, which will be on eleventh uh, of uh, Feb. Uh, yeah. Which will be on 11th of Feb. Uh, moving, uh, the title will be the moving from a functional alignment to an anatomical alignment of radiation on the medical services by Dr. Seen George Gunn, and it will be moderated by V. Subramani, uh, Dr. V. Subramani from India. So I hope uh, that would be we will be having all of you in that webinar also. So from my end, thank you very much for being with us. And uh, Dr. Kitiwat and Dr. Pradeep, thank you very much for being with us and having give, give uh, us uh, some of your precious time from your prayer busy schedules. So thank you very much once again to all of you being with us. And uh, see you soon on 11th of February. Thank you. All right. Thanks thank a lot. Thank you. Thank everyone. Yeah, thank you. Bye now. Yeah, thank you so much. And hopefully it's not too late to say that Happy New Year to everyone again. <laughs> yes. Happy New Year. We shouldn't have said that. Yeah. Okay, happy new year. And um, please stay safe. Happy new year with the, with the health on priority. We have to beat yeah. Omicron. Yeah, be safe. Okay, yeah. please stay safe. All right. Bye bye. Okay, okay. okay bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Okay, see you again. See you again.